Good evening, and welcome to the 2017 public lecture series on the Wisconsin idea, past and present. This lecture series is part of a course being offered through the Department of Sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I am Dr. Eric Sandgren, a professor at the School of Veterinary Medicine, and I have the honor of serving as the course coordinator this year. Students, I'd like to remind you to uh, sign in, please. I do have two announcements about our next two meetings. Next week, we'll be across the street again in the town center, and the week after that, we'll be here, but I invite you all to stick around for a little while afterwards. There'll be some cake and beverages, and uh, in particular, I can get a chance to, to meet the students who are taking this for one credit, uh, whose faces I see every week, uh, but really haven't had a chance to speak with yet. Um, the Wisconsin idea has always been about more than training students for the workforce. It has been, as Adlai Stevenson put it, a faith in the application of intelligence and reason to the problems of society. The aspiration to light the way of Wisconsin's citizens and government with the best torches of knowledge and understanding that their university can provide. Accordingly, this lecture series and the course with which it is associated aim to get, bring together students, staff, and faculty in the UW system uh, into a broad conversation with the citizens of the state about how the knowledge produced at the University of Wisconsin has benefited the public in the past and continues to do so today. I encourage you to participate actively through our course website, www.wiskidea.com. If you would like to contribute to the project, you please consider making a contribution to the Wisconsin Idea course UW Foundation Fund, which you can find through the website. We are fortunate to continue our series tonight with a lecture by Paul Williams. Paul is a professor emeritus in the Department of Plant Pathology in the College of Ag and Life Sciences. In 1959, Paul came to Wisconsin as a graduate student in plant pathology from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, uh, where he grew as, as a boy. In 1962, he assumed a professorship in plant pathology at Wisconsin, from which he retired 20 years ago. Since he arrived at the UW, he has grown increasingly under the spell of the Wisconsin idea. And it is that story that he hopes to share with you this evening. We are. Um, like all of our uh, speakers, he is graciously donating his time and expertise free of charge out of a commitment to public service. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Williams. Thank you, Eric, for those gracious words. And uh, good evening, ladies and de gentlemen, uh, students. I'm glad you're here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, the organizers, to uh, begin to more formally immerse myself in the Wisconsin idea. And hopefully I'll be able to share that with you this evening as we roam around in the Wisconsin cabbage patch. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here and see a, a, a professor that you will meet on the slides uh, in one of my cabbage patches in Florida about 50 years ago. As he was retiring near Orlando, took me into a Morrison's Cafe and he said, Paul, he said, uh, if you had a nickel for every gray hair in here, you'd be a wealthy man. <laughs> well, I won't say any more to you. <laughs> uh, we're going to begin a story and I am uh, going to ask you to sort of it's going to be sort of in three pieces, and it's going to get increasingly complex because life started out pretty simple for me, and I'm going to just begin to learn how to use this uh, fancy equipment. It's really about something that I followed as a kid. I followed my passion, and I'm going to summarize on that. As a boy, I loved nature and botany and growing plants, and I grew a lot of plants. And of course, as you already learned, I grew up in Vancouver, which is kind of a Garden of Eden. Some of you will have traveled to Vancouver, I'm sure, on your way to Alaska, or places like that. And uh, we'll understand that it's a mild climate. Plant pathology presented a broad 
and uh, interesting challenge. It was more challenging than just propagating plants and growing plants and gardening. You had to know about the pathogens and the microbes and the things that also wanted meals out of plants. And so I took a, at U University of British Columbia, I took a bachelor's degree, and some of my professors were, as you can understand, were graduate students and met at professors at UBC were, were graduates of Wisconsin. And they said, you gotta go to Wisconsin because Wisconsin leads the nation in plant pathology. This was in the 1950s. It was the bastion of plant pathology. And so it was one of the great land grants that I came to know. I was asked on the telephone all the way to British Columbia. I was offered by a gentleman named Professor Pound, who later became the dean of the college. And we'll meet him in a minute. He said, I've got an assistantship for you. And it's from Wharf. I didn't know what Wharf was. I was from the boonies out in British Columbia. <laughs> but that story will ripen as we go. And he said, by the way, this, this, this uh, research that you're going to do is on radishes. And I thought, oh gosh. <laughs> How on earth can one acquire a PhD on a radish? <laughs> well, it's an interesting. So I arrived in, in Madison in September 1959, and this is the train. I, this town is full of ghosts. This is the train I took, the Empire Builder from Seattle. I took a train down, and on the train was my bicycle. And if you'll see, I took a picture of my bicycle. <laughs> when I started biking on this campus, I was, if this is true, there were three bicycles in 1959. <laughs> I kid you not. Imagine, talk about change. And there's the station I came into. Well, we got off the train at Columbus, and they, they met, I was met there, and um, bust down to this depot, which is now a bicycle shop. <laughs> <laughs> kind of interesting, isn't it? What goes, comes around, goes around, or goes around, comes around. Well, this was my graduate home. I had a dorm room in Trip Hall, overlooking Lake Mendota, and I thought I was in heaven because uh, it looked over there. Lake Mendota was clean, there wasn't any algae in it, and every dorm had a pier, and you could go swimming. Mm -hmm. Times have changed. You all know that. Um, I was in T-18, the Army Hut. This, this top end of T-18 right here was the data processing, so-called computer. Half that building was computer for Dairy Herd Improvement Association. The middle was a a bullpen of graduate students and used army equipment, and that was our lab. And the other end was Doc Nichols' fistulated cow, and uh, beyond that was Aaron Bowrod's studio. Does this get memories going for you, some of you? Yeah. So it wasn't long before Russell Lab was conceived as a joint building, and we will get into that. I want to talk a little bit about legacy and heritage because that's what the Wisconsin idea is and you've had a great introduction to that in the previous lectures that we've had and I have been listening to those. I haven't met you guys on the audience but it's been wonderful and my legacy is a very interesting one from the timing of when I arrived because I arrived in 1959 was exactly 50 years after Lewis Ralph Jones was taken back to Wisconsin he was born in Brandon, Wisconsin. Anybody know where Brandon is? Great. Few of you do, but that's one of your assignments tonight. <laughs> because his, 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 in his cemetery of Brandon is a beautiful monument to Lewis Ralph Jones. He came uh, and got his degree in Michigan and then went off to Vermont as the forestry professor. But, he, and he was a very distinguished professor. He established the Department of Plant Pathology and there are stories there and the reading assignments uh, not the, not the required reading students, but the supplementary reading, if you get into that, into this book here, which I did 50 years, or 75 years after the history, after the department began. But at any rate, G.C. Walker, John Charles Walker, was a Racine, the son of a milkman. Went to BB School in Racine, it isn't there anymore. But he matriculated here in 1910, was Jones's student, undergrad student, and won the science medal for the best undergraduate thesis 
of this campus. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. And if you read Walker's first chapter in this book, it was, fortunately we made, we wrote this, we had this book put together and when his, when he was 85, he lived to 101. And he wrote just like this. He could just write straight off. Anyway, a very distinguished plant pathologist and later I'll tell you, but he <coughs> gave me some advice because I fought, I am part, he is part of my lineage. His student was Glenn Pound, who was a son of a postman from Arkansas who sharecropped with his wife Daisy in Texas. Made enough money to go back to, this, to Arkansas, got his degree to Arkansas, at Arkansas, and then came back to Wisconsin just as the war was starting. And he was Walker's student. Glenn Pound, and these stories I can't tell you, but they're fascinating stories, saved the cabbage industry of the Russians during the Second World War. Because if you know, if you've been to Russia or Eastern Europe, you know what their favorite food is? Cabbage soup called borscht. And you eat a lot of borscht wherever you are. And they needed their cabbage and they weren't getting it because the Germans had cut it off because the supply was coming from Holland of seed. But Pound saved that because there was a, a devastating disease in the cabbage crops of western Washington, where all our cabbage seeds come from. Mount Vernon, north of Seattle, is the cabbage seed country. Okay, so Pound, anyway, got his degree with Walker and went on uh, as chair of plant pathology, and he's the guy who called me and said, I've got a, an assistantship for you. Come on, and I came. So that's the story, and later Pound said to me, he only gave me this advice. He said, wear three hats, Paul. This is when I had the good fortune that I'll tell you about in a moment. But this was the time, I'm going back to Jones now, when another important man that you have met in this lecture series, I know that. This is a really cool photograph, 1918, and you know who we've got here. We've got Van Heys, and he's kind of one of our fathers of the Wisconsin idea. Chamberlain, who preceded him, geologist, and if you haven't been to Chamberlain's Rock on Observatory Hill, that's another assignment for you. <laughs> Take a nice stroll and enjoy the view and then look at this enormous <coughs> boulder. And that's Chamberlain's. This man is the man that we're really talking about because Russell Lab is named after him now, but he was appointed in the 1890s as a microbiologist. And here we have Dean Henry, who preceded Russell as Dean, and we all know that. I mean, if we're gonna give you an exam, it's gonna be, who is that, <laughs> right? Because you've heard that Babcock story over and over again, and that's great. So that's Stephen Moulton Babcock. Well, let's get into our cabbage story. Your ancestors, if you're from Wisconsin, and if you're from the Midwest, or anywhere north of, uh, I suppose, the Mason-Dixon line, whatever that is, uh, they subsisted, before there was interstates and railroads, they subsisted throughout the winter on things like cabbage. They had to store it. They're, they needed their vitamins in addition to their calories. And cabbage was a tradition that came from Northern Europe, a stored, nutritious vegetable. And so all around the Great Lakes, from Ohio to Wisconsin, through Indiana, there were lots of cabbage fields because people stored that cabbage. It got white, they made coleslaw, and they also made sauerkraut. They pickled it, which is a tradition that came from, really from China. Maybe Marco Polo taught the Germans how to make sauerkraut. I don't know that piece of it. But the Chinese were, were pickling cabbage and their relatives thousands of years ago. But what happened is that this is what a cabbage field began, they began to look like from time to time. And believe it or not, and this is the 18, uh, this, have we got a date on that? 1895, thanks. <laughs> you can see it better than I can. 1895, this picture is a picture of Harry Russell in a field as the microbiologist of this campus who was doing medical, who was doing uh, animal microbiology, but also plant microbiology, and this was a bacterial disease called black rot. Devastating. Seed born. It travels in the seeds, so once it's in, you're in trouble. Okay, that's all plant pathology. We're not talking about that. 
But I want you to notice this man. This, this man is, just look at his coat and look at his hat, because that's, 19, that's 1895 in a cabbage field in Racine County. And the cabbage, the, the black rot comes and goes. You plant clean seed, you get clean cabbage. But increasingly across the, the northern tier in cabbages and other vegetable crops, the soil was becoming sick because they called it sick soil. And finally, Russell was appointed dean. And he said, we've got to establish the Department of Plant Pathology. And so he went to the native son, who was the forester in Vermont, L.R. Jones, and brought him in to set up the Department of Plant Pathology in 1909, 1910. And this is a picture of Jones. This guy, I looked at his diary, traveled by train in those days, and how he had a photograph taken of himself pulling a resistant cabbage out of a sick field of cabbage. The man who brought him down here is this guy here, J.J. Davis, who's a homeopathic physician in Racine. This is J.J. Davis 15 years earlier. He hadn't changed his coat or his hat. <laughs> So isn't that interesting? But we have captured that. What, what, was jo what Jones was doing was slaving from an epidemic field resistant plants because not many years earlier, about 19, about five years earlier, genetics began to be born by the discovery of, rediscovery of Mendel's hidden research that sat for almost 50 years unread by anybody because it was in an obscure manual from Moravia. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff that sort of mounts out of a history and a legacy. So this is what, these cabbages that you see here have to go through a winter in order to induce them to flower. They have to spend about 12 weeks below 45 degrees, and then the vegetative component of the plant, the genes, now we know we can talk genes, you know, we can talk fancy genetics, but we still have to do it. We have to put them in the cold, keep them cold like winter, and that's why they're growing in Mount Vernon. We can't do it outdoors in Wisconsin because they freeze to death. So in Wisconsin, you pull the plants out, you put them in a cold room for 12 weeks, bring them out and pot them up and put them in the green, in the ground or the greenhouse. Well, there were no greenhouses. Does anybody know where this is on the campus? You guys aren't very far away from here. Look at that car, isn't that cool? <laughs> this is the row of cabbages that Jones pulled out of the field and came out of the cold room and he planted and they're starting to burst. You see the heads are bursting. And then they, oh, excuse me, they also got a greenhouse. The dean bought them a greenhouse. They built a greenhouse and they planted them right in the greenhouse and they flowered. And we've got a photograph in 1915. Walker graduated in 14. He's now a grad student of Jones. And there he is, pollinating cabbage. Okay, this is the row of the seed from these plants back in the field where Jones pulled them out. And this is what farmers went to the field in. Sort of gives you a sense of time. I love, I love these pictures. This is in 1912. Okay, it takes two years to get a crop of cabbage seed. Well, let the selection go on, more, more, more seed and, the, and more, more resistant cabbages and more seed produced. And now this guy Jones, he, he started, you know, this, he started to be known, not just by the farmers, but by the regents of the University of Wisconsin. This is a meeting of the regents of the University of Wisconsin in Jones's cabbage field in 1960. And there's stories to be told about that, but the reason is that they've put them in, here's the resistant cabbage now, and here's the susceptible. They always were doing experiments in the fields of the farmers. Think of the power of that kind of an outreach where the farmers, well, what we're trying to do. What's that? What building is that? Down here? Oh, oh, you want to know? You know, that should be an assignment for you. <laughs> it's there, it is right there. Do you think I should give away, you know, as, as his teacher, should I give you the answer? No, if I'm a good teacher and I get a good question from a smart student, I don't answer it. Why? Well, maybe I'll learn 
this, won't they? <laughs> Not only will you, but all the other people here are going to want to know. And what are they going to do? Well, uh, See, you're the smartest guy in the class right now, if you think you know, but well, we can test you on that, but we're not going to. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, this is what we're, we're talking about. So we got a great question. We got two questions here. What is this building and what is that? One of those two buildings is still here. Okay, that's all I'm going to, that's essentially the big hit for the, for the morning. Okay, so now we're going to roll through, now, you know, the 1920s. This is the Madison campus, west. It was a literal carpet of cabbage. Isn't that something? Can you uh, can actually figure out where you are here? This is kind of a fun game. <laughs> you know, there's a few landmarks. You all know what this is, right? Uh, first congregation. First Congo Church, right. Okay, and so you'll see some things that aren't no, are no longer there, and those things are. But you know what? We're going to keep moving, but I wanted to show you that this is a selection plot of cabbage because here are the cabbages. See them down in front here? They've been pulled out. The leaves are stripped off and the heads are put in the cold room for 12 weeks or the winter and then they're potted in. That's how you get cabbage seed. Then the seed comes off in May and it's too late to plant that year, and so it takes two years to get seed for a generation of cabbage. The other thing is, that's an interesting old photograph. Do you get a tint of green in that? Yeah. yeah. This was before color photography. <laughs> so you're beginning to see what they did. You've seen some of these in your own experience. That uh, These old archival photos are kind of cool because that's how they made color photographs. Okay, I just want to now move to John Charles Walker. In just before I arrived, 1957, here he is in Racine County with the farmers, the, sa the sauerkraut packers, and the seedsmen. And he is... <coughs> pulling out these resistant heads, which become the first resistant cabbage line to a whole set of diseases that Walker was working with. Everything had resistance to the yellows disease that I showed you because that was the hallmark of Wisconsin cabbage. In fact, Walker's brother started the Wisconsin Cabbage Seed Company, which then went on to produce the seed that distributed worldwide and is still uh, the company is not going, but the seed is certainly going. Anyway, this is, these, are, these are typical farmers and crop packers, and they're listening to Walker. Here's Walker right here. He's just telling them the way it is in the field right there. Well, you know, Walker wasn't going to live forever either. He started in 1910. I arrived in 1959 and was a grad student with Pound, Walker student, as I said. And in my second year of grad school, and uh, I was working on radishes, but Pound said, uh, Paul, I want you to come to the National Crop Packers meeting that we're hosting here uh, because uh, the Crop Packers had asked Walker, they knew he was going to retire, they said, uh, can't we do something? The whole industry, can't we do something for the university to be sure that our interests are served? This is the old Wisconsin idea, right down to the grassroots. And Walker, he had an interesting way of talking. He said, uh, build me a greenhouse and I'll fill it with somebody. <laughs> that was, he was like, he was a one-liner guy. He was tough as nails. Fortunately, I wasn't a student. <laughs> so that's what he said, build him a greenhouse and we'll find somebody. And uh, so Pound then asked me to stand up at this meeting. He said, we've just got the guy who's gonna fill that greenhouse and then the next week, I didn't show this picture, but in the building next door here, I was offered, I'll tell you the story. I showed it to the students and they, I wasn't sure. Anyway, I was at a two-holer in the men's room, <laughs> filling one of the holes and Brown came into the next one, zipped and said, Paul, I've just been meeting uh, with the faculty and you were the subject. And I thought, oh geez, what's next? He said, we want you to take J.C. Walker's position. Uh, he's going to retire next year, so get going. That was my offer. <laughs> that was it. I never signed. I, I never signed. I never signed a piece of paper, and uh, it's it's a true story. I said thank you very much and zipped up too, and that was it. <laughs> so um, yeah. So this was. The point I want to make here is up in this corner, it's, it's 
hanging on to your constituency, and also maintaining continuity. These are, conceptually, these are really what we're struggling with, aren't we? <laughs> Everywhere. And this is just a little tiny piece of it. Well, what was I to do? Here I was a freshly minted uh, professor, and by golly, I was going to church regularly and had the good fortune, actually, this is, is, this is not rehearsed, to meet this young lady right here. <laughs> She's sitting right here <laughs> at a church uh, grad student club, supper club on, on the corner of university and charter. Anyway, and so things happened there, too. <laughs> In any event, um, I, as a new professor, uh, was applying newer techniques that I learned here at Wisconsin, biochemistry and so forth, but genetics appealed to me and I was given as my startup, you know, they say, what's my startup package on, on this campus now? And they negotiate for 100,000 to this and this big a lab and so on. I was going, I was just said, Walker just said, well, you'll just follow me around behind me in the cabbage patch. These are the guys who plant the cabbage for you. Here's the greenhouse already made. That's my startup. And so that's the way it was. The other thing that's interesting is that that piece of the industry was sufficiently, as were several industries, I'm just a tiny example of things that were across this College of Agriculture and across this university. The deans like Russell had lobbied and negotiated with the legislature to put line items in the budget. So I had a line item cabbage assistantship which guaranteed me a graduate student. Can you imagine today that happened? I had one in cucumbers too. I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm telling you the cabbage story tonight. I could go on in several other vegetables, but I think the cabbage really wraps it up nice. So anyway, I, I, I had that support of field and connection with the industry behind me. My responsibility was annually to put on a meeting for all of the whole industry, the kraut packers, the seed companies, and the growers, to come to Madison. And they would meet, and we would tell them what was new. And they were connected because it was, we were theirs, but they were ours. That's the Wisconsin idea, right down to the bottom line, I, I think. So I began to say, well, there are more diseases in the world than fusarium yellows and black rot and began to work and found black rot in the desk of an old Japanese seed breeder in Kyoto, Japan. He pulled that seed packet out and gave it to me and these are the progeny that we developed later and here are the controls at the Hancock experiment station to show you how resistant we were able to make cabbage under an epidemic condition. This was the nemesis and still is the nemesis, the club root disease is now the re-emerging nemesis of the canola crop of Canada, the number one oil crop in Canada. The number one crop in Canada is canola, which is a brassica. We're going to meet brassicas in a minute. So here we are, club root. I spent a lot of time doing fundamental research on club root. But multiple disease resistance was what we were talking about, not just one disease, but diseases that reach across the world. And at that time, Plant breeding was becoming much more sophisticated. There were things like hybrids beginning to. So we had to learn the genetics underlying how to produce hybrid cabbage, hybrid vegetables, because hybrid corn had taken off, and so forth. So eventually, this is just a sketch that doesn't mean, need, need to mean anything to you, except that it gets more complicated to breed for resistance to A, B, C, and D different diseases, and incorporated in such a way that when you breed a mother and a father, you get a F1, what's called a hybrid, that's more vigorous and more uniform, and able to be machine harvested. So this was our first hybrid. We called it Cenobel, because in the winter, we put our crops in Florida, and we had a dual-purpose cabbage. We had a kraut cabbage in Wisconsin. See, those, those cabbages are 10 pounds a head. Nobody wants that in your refrigerator. But when that same cabbage is grown under a short day length, in Florida or Texas, it's just what you want, two pounds. Mm -hmm. So you can make a bagging cabbage when you want it in the south, ship it north, and you can make a kraut cabbage in Wisconsin. And uh, 
multiple disease resistant and everything a good cabbage should be. <laughs> so here we are machine harvesting. So this is, but times were changing. So in the process of all of this, I was releasing what we called the badger inbreds. It, most of the cabbages that Jones and Walker released and pound were Wisconsin this and Wisconsin that. And I thought, well, you know, we're going to wear Wisconsin out. Let's just call them badger. So we released about 30 different inbreds. But what does that mean? These are lines that are very uniform and can be matched. But you know, what's happening is that times are changing in the seed world. At the same time as we're doing all of this basic research here on this campus, we're educating an awful lot of really smart students who get PhDs degrees and now go to these emerging seed companies that are producing the seed and food you eat. And they don't want Wisconsin, they want their own proprietary hybrids that they can control and get the right remuneration with, you see. So the badger inbreds are not used with badger names on them, they're used by seed companies and then they have extracted them and made their own. And that's, that's the way the world is going. It's just that a big public university like this, when you release something like that, all the competitors can have it and then it isn't a niche market. So that's, that's how the world, world has and is changing. And we saw it around us, which is an interesting issue in itself. Well, now we've been in a different story. Because as a plant breeder and plant pathologist, I had to go looking for multiple disease resistance and cabbage didn't, just wasn't, had enough variation. So I wanted to look at its relatives. So these are now, instead of cabbage, we're gonna talk brassica. So cabbage is just one of a large family of plants called brassica family. There are over 3,000 species of brassica family, but there's one genus in that family. There's three, over 300 genera of brassica, but there's one called brassica, and that's the one we... So it's the type genus of the family Brassicaceae. And we're gonna get you into a little botany. I bet you didn't know you were gonna be doing botany with me tonight. So this, is, this defines the Brassica family. It's the, used to be called the crucifery because the petals are in the form of a cross, a cru crucifix. And these number of anthers, this is the pollen, and here's the pistil. This is the genus Brassica. And don't worry about, you're not gonna have an exam. But what is interesting is there are six interrelated brassica species. And I'm gonna introduce them to you just a little bit tonight because t three of them, brassica nigra, and this is the number of chromosomes in that species in the sex cell. That's the B genome. Now we're talking genetics. The genome has eight chromosomes. Brassica oleracea has nine chromosomes which, and Brassica rapa has 10. In nature, these have crossed and become Brassica juncea, Brassica carinata, and Brassica napus. So this is a naturally occurring group of species that are capable of exchanging genetic information. And therefore, if I know a little bit about them, I can look for a disease resistant and Brassica nigra. This is in my hand here. here. You know where I got this? Right on the campus. Mm -hmm. Along the railway tracks on the south side beyond the hospital. Great walking stick. And pointer, by the way. Wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> anyway, these are the genomic interrelationships, and that's as tough as it's going to get tonight for you, so don't worry. But I want you to take you around the world because the brassicas are such a fascinating group. They are like the dogs, only more so, because they have had enough variation genetically structured in their mating systems that no two brassicas are, are the same, no two individuals. They're just like this room of people. How do they do it? Because they don't self-fertilize. They are self-incompatible. We teach teachers all about that but they cross and therefore it mixes the variants of the genes that they contain. The alleles are variants of genes 
so that there's a vast number of alleles at each gene. And when they combine, you get all of this variation, which humans over several hundred to several thousand years, depending on where they are on the globe, select for their own uses. And that's why we have so many brassica vegetables that look different in each species. So here are brassica oleracea. Now, meet brassica oleracea. Well, we told you. Well, I just got the cheapest ones I could get because uh, I was shopping at an expensive store. This is brassica oleracea, broccoli. This is brassica oleracea, our friend the cabbage. This is brassica oleracea, Brussels sprouts. And this is brassica oleracea. Anybody want a nice antique Victorian walking stick? Mm -hmm. Brassica, a Brussels sprout stick. See where the Brussels sprouts came from? Well, here's my other favorite little brassica oleracea. I'm going to meet her. This is Max and Mildred. I, you see, they're both male and female, so you've got to give them two names. This is this, tree cabbage from Portugal. Only this is a little one. This is a student of mine from Portugal, and there's what tree cabbage looks like. In the Jersey Islands, the Brits turn these into walking sticks, and all of those walking sticks go into the orthopedic hospitals of Britain because they're strong and they're light. But in the meantime, the Portuguese have stripped off the leaves, which look like collard greens, very nutritious, and they have it at Christmas time as their national dish, caula vera, with salt cod, caula vera, brassica oleracea, and potatoes. You're not a Portuguese unless you eat that frequently. Okay, so this is your brassica story, just sort of getting you warmed up. This is Brassica oleracea. So as I got deeper into brassicology, if you want to call it that, I was noted by somebody and was fortunate to be on the, uh, one of the early exchanges before, after the ping pong match with Ch in China, Nixon's. So in 1977, I was part of a vegetable farming systems delegation of 12 people as the pathologist on that system, studying Chinese vegetable farming. And this is harvesting cabbage in 1977 in China. Uh, I was invited back in 80, spent another month teaching the Chinese about the modern things we knew, and uh, have been afraid to go back. Although, as we walked over this evening to here, a student came running up to me. She was about this tall, and she says, Professor Williams, you remember me? Hu Di, she's right out of Nanjing Agricultural College, and she's just used some of our fast plants and achieved something I'll talk to you about uh, that she's going to, she's real excited about, and so am I. <laughs> so that's news hot off the press. Now, um, so this is, this is, this is, brassicas have taken me around the world and in many, many interesting situations because the most important vegetable in India, that's a huge population, there for the Canadian government was cauliflower. And you know, if you're eating, a, you're going to have curried cauliflower if you're eating at an Indian restaurant. You better be. Here's cauliflower production in the Himalayan fo foothills and so on. This is in China, where the, you know, this was right after the Cultural Revolution when nothing had moved yet in China. Um, and they were they harvested and they harvested, take them into the from the peri urban communes into the marketplaces, and then all of the harvesters picked up every leaf. And they took that home, and that's what they had. So, you know, this was under the strictest of strict communist kind of systems. Here's a different species, and it's this one right here. It's the one we're going to get familiar with and talk about all evening. This is a turnip. But if, this is a, if you were in China or Korea, it's brassica rapa, bai sai, bok choy, and many other things. So here's a young, here's a woman up, I'm in the mountains up in a, a little village up in a, and she gave, boy, she gave me a scrutable look when I said, do you have any seed? And I was collecting seeds because I needed to get collections to find resistance and variation so that I could intermate and mix with. Okay. Well, in, in the foothills of the Himalayans, Brassica juncea, which contains the B genome. This is a C. This is this is 
black mustard. This thing is Brassica nigra. That's why it's a toughy. It's a weed. Brassica nigra, the most one of the. It's on the ten most wanted noxious leads, weeds. But boy, has it got a lot of interesting genes in it for durability, drought resistance, invasiveness, you name it. <laughs> Things we don't want. Well, above that time, I realized that I wasn't going to live long enough if I, could maintain, if I had to maintain brassica as a two-year life cycle. So I went and, and collected this huge collection of over 2,000 different brassicas, got them into that greenhouse you saw, Walker Greenhouse, and began to grow them out. But I said, could I breed? So this was my eureka moment, 1973. Could I breed brassicas that would be faster in their life cycle so I could extract more genetic information from them? If I could get genetic information on disease resistance and this and that, I could then put them together, intermate them, not genetic engineering by standard, but standard, good old fashioned plant sex. You know, pollination, buzz bee, and so on. So these were the conditions under which I needed to consider. I wanted re rapid seed maturation, minimum time from putting the seed in, absence of seed dormancy. That's a critical one because most of these brassicas in their native habitat, 99% of the seed is dormant until it hits the right condition, condition. So it stays in the ground for 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. You stir the soil up and up come the weeds. That's a great evolutionary strategy if you're going to live on and on and on over changing environments which we which plants are in the in nature but in agriculture you don't you want every seed to germinate but that if you breed out the dormancy then you safen that from becoming a weed so i took i eliminated dormancy and i wanted a small plant with high female fertility which means lots of seed and when i grew out thousands of these I picked the first 10% to flower and intermated them, mixed the genes, and then saved the progeny and did it again and over. It's called recurrent phenotypic mass selection. That's a big word for plant breeders, but we just look at the phenotype we want. So what was the phenotype? It was this, small plants. I wanted them to, and so the environment becomes important. What is the environment that you're going to grow them under to select them? And here it is. I wanted to grow lots of plants, so that's, that, yes, that says 833 plants per square meter. And I wanted them to grow in a simple standard medium soil, not this soil and that soil, but something I could. I wanted them with a standard nutrient solution, and I wanted the same amount of light, which I'm going to show you in just a second, what 250 micromoles looks like. And then I wanted a temperature that I like, too. Basically, I wanted them in my office. <laughs> And guess what? I did it all in my office. Once I got out of the greenhouse. So this is 250 micromoles of light LEDs and meet the fast plants. Right here. Growing in a bottle system. So these plants right here, I'm going to show you these because these are ones that sort of are featured in the title. These are astro plants. They're a special, little bright. Yeah, okay. Plants love it. <laughs> These are the astro plants developed with, from variation that have been on the space station and shuttle, and if we have time, which we aren't going to, because I'm blurbing too much, but you're, no, not, too many, not too many have gone to sleep, sir. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you got, this is a simple system, and we'll have a little bit more to say about it. These plants were, have been on the space shuttle Numerous times were the first plants to produce seed and have germinable seed come on. So, you know, plants can do it up there just fine. And this is the pollination device right here that we invented called a bee stick. That's the thorax of a honeybee or a bumblebee glued on a toothpick. And it's nature's most perfect device. And I am inviting you to come on up after you're done and have uh, do a little pollinating. And then I can have something for you if you do. And uh, you could also probably sample here a little kimchi, which I made in this, uh, this soda bottle, which is another piece of our story when we get it into classrooms. But this is Korean national dish. It'll knock you over. Not, 
delicious. Okay, so this is the conditions, and I'm going to really whirl through the slides here, that they grew, and this is what I was able for each of the six species to accelerate in days to flower. So the plants you're looking at right here, actually today, the, the astro plants, the seed was put in the ground a week ago. And they're in full flower today. So that gives me a tool to do genetics and do lots of cool stuff. And for each of the species that are on that triangle, we were able to reduce this to this number of cycles per year instead of one cycle every year or two. So that became the Wisconsin fast plants. And it was used by me and my students in research and in education here on the campus. I tested it in my BioCore classes. Jim Crow, a famous geneticist from this building here, used it in his classes, bless his whole. And Ray Kessel, TAing for Jim, said these are going to be really helpful. And then I said, OK. I'm going to give my seed away to some of my colleagues at Cornell in California and so on, and they started. But this is a, a living graph. You see, this is the days after sowing, just to show you what can be done in 10 cc's of soil. These are, these are little tiny cells. So then I established a collection in my department, which still exists, called the Rapid Cycling Brassica Collection, which serves researchers and educators who want to do educational research. Seed comes in, calls come in to me, and I produce that seed and send it out around the world. And I got an email today to send a collection of all of these species to, a, to Taiwan. So I've got to get permits and all that kind of thing, but they will go off. So these are some of the genetic stocks, and that's the website of that particular collection. Just wanted to show you that the rapid cycling stocks of this are in six species. And they're the same six species that we were talking about. So now enter complexity, because now out of the cabbage field, still in the cabbage field, but in addition, there is now a research collection, a seed collection of fast cycling brassicas, plus the potential for education. So this, was the, this is how we set up the uh, the seed collection. It's called the Rapid Cycling Brassica Collection. They're genetic seeds. Many, many stocks now are being incorporated into this rapid cycling background. And the seed is called open source. That means that anybody can write me and get it. And then I'll, I'll share with them. Out of that has come, for the past 25 years, all kinds of research from all over the world, including our own. And so papers just, people were right for seed, and suddenly, two years later, you see research being published in publications. And it's uh, coming back to Wisconsin. So that is sort of the rapid cycling brassica piece of that story. And this a review with you once again the richness that exists in basically growing an organism. This is where we're, this is where we're going to come to the educational piece pretty quickly. But this is the graph like the living graph, but this is what's going on sexually. This is embryogenesis, something that isn't even taught in botany classes. is the, one of the most fascinating components. After you pollinate, how does the baby develop? What goes on? It's all of that pre-seed embryonic development is very accessible in the pods of the developing plant. And it's easy for kids and teachers to dissect that and follow it and do research on it. So here's the life cycle in photographs, where you start with a pod. These are all siblings, because they're coming out of the tissue of a single mother. But it raises a question, what about the father? That depends on the kind of pollination that went on. Right? And then here's germination. Here's a seed. This is 36 hours after putting the seed in the ground, 48 and so forth. Then this is the whole study of what we call coevolution. How do flowers develop in relationship to their needs to mate? So we have hummingbird flowers. You gardeners out there, you know you all. You have bees, you have ants, you have bats pollinating them. You have all kinds of interesting. And the flowers have co-evolved with the pollinators. So that story. And then, as I say, really not taught, and I wish they would teach more, is embryogenesis. 
Here's the, what the ovules look like. Here's a bee stick right here. Here is a globular embryo. This is a spherical entity of the new generation. And just a few days later, here is a torpedo embryo. This is the, the, the names for embryogenesis are very Victorian. And they're very interesting when you read about embryogenesis. And it's easy for kids to do that because that's just popped an ovule and floated out in water. And they can see it under a hand lens or a microscope. So development is important. So the other thing about brassicas is that they're highly phenotypically plastic. That is to say, they still stay on time when you change the environment drastically. And this is just answering that question is more food. And the food is just the pellets of fertilizer we put in. And look at here, what no, pellet, no fertilizer and then too much. So there are all kinds of interesting lessons that can come out of instructional materials. So this then brought in the Wisconsin fast plant. So from a rapid cycling brassica, which was a, was, a, was a research tool, we developed the Wisconsin fast plant program. And Co, my wife sitting here, was responsible for helping me along with her job share partner, Jane Share, who had just become, uh, I call them high school mothers without children in high school <laughs> and looking for something to do. <laughs> And I said, come on over, we'll talk every, at five o'clock after my real work's done, we'll talk about the potential for writing a grant to the National Science Foundation. And uh, boy, they wrote and I talked and then they, they got the grant. But the interesting thing is that we produced uh, material with grants. And so I wanted to show you here, the Wisconsin Fast Plant Program really is driven by this little mantra which really is powerful and important, to know a plant, grow a plant. You gardeners do this recreationally, you do it aesthetically, but in a classroom, if a child drops a seed, they own what comes, they race back the next day in elementary or preschool or even in college to see what happened to their seed. And that curiosity is rekindled in their mind instead of being rekindled on, uh, you know, something like this. You know, which is just an artifice. I'm sorry, it's very handy. We're all enslaved to it. But anyway, so this is, this is uh, what, what uh, we're saying is, now there's another entity that comes in here that's very important. And that's where I wanted to summarize with you still. Is increasingly, we produced this material with support. And the support came from the university industry relations, which we don't have on this campus, and I can't understand why. I could tell you more, and we had a wonderful lecture for a historian who was here talking about the history of war. I, I listened to that. He never mentioned UIR because it doesn't exist, but this was uh, an infusion of faculty. I had a UIR professor in my department. He said, you know, Paul, this is interesting stuff you're doing. You should, uh, you should go to war. In fact, UIR, has some, uh, some fellowships to help you speed along. And so we went to the university industry relations team. And eventually, uh, with the thanks to Howard Bremer, who was mentioned in your wharf talk, uh, convinced him, he wasn't convinced that fast plants were something a wharf would take. Nah. He says, that's education. We don't do education. You know, we do science and we do this, that. But we, he said, I'll take a chance on it. So he did. And we're very grateful because Wharf is a terrifically important part of this scene. They enabled us basically to this. They patent, they trademark. And so here's the first patent on fast plants uh, in 1989. And this is what it was for, an educational kit. I wanted to hold on to the seed. I didn't want them to patent the seed because that's, you know, germplasm, that's different. Well, there's debates on that even these days, and that's fine too. But anyway, patents have only run for 17 years, and they ran out, and so Worf said, we will trademark it. And so they trademarked the Wisconsin Fast Plants. And now they give me permission to use the name, mm -hmm. which is good, because it protects me. What it does, it enables royalties 
funds and so on to be licensed, and that's what the next part of this complex is. Wharf licensed the fast plant name and earlier the trademark to the Carolina Biological Company. They looked all over for the best marketer that would do the job and they found Carolina, which is a huge company that markets to teachers and schools all over the world, really, but all over this country. And fast plants have become a major. They then will pay royalties to Wharf. Now, as a professor at the university, this is something that some of you may know or may not. I'm entitled to those royalties, a small percentage of them, and my department is, and then the rest goes to Wharf, who give it to the graduate school, which pays back for the fellowship that I arrived on, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> So I feel good about that, but I decided not to take the royalties, but to turn them to the UW Foundation. And so we began to develop a fund in the foundation that would be investing the money we gave to them to then help fund the program under when times got tough, when we couldn't get grants or we wanted to expand something. So you see all these arrows, it's kind of crazy. Uh, it is very complex but it's part of that whole system. So I want to show you some of the products just and people. So these are fast plants now. So these, this is the pods, you see, so you can be very precise about the timing of the pollination because this is like a linear axis on a graph and these are eight hours apart developmentally. This is what's so cool about it. So developmentally you've got eight hours differences in the seeds that come. And then these are some of the kinds of kits and, and growing conditions, these were produced by a high school teacher in Arkansas for his school district. And he made these and sipped them all over and he got money to do that in this, this summer project, a teacher, what a cool thing. And then these are some of the kits that Carolina markets. This was something I developed and I just want to bring one of them down because this is like a mass, maximum investment right there for growing them in bottles of $20. You can just go to Staples in the hardware store and make all that you need for growing really nice fast plants. So this is uh, just another thing. These are kinds of t examples of uses. Here's a teacher signing. signing. These, are, these are deaf kids, and she's signing the growth. Here's some uh, elementary girls modeling flowers. And this is one of my BioCore classes, where way back when Professor Becker was, was lecturing and I was doing the lab, in BioCore, he set it up so that every student as they came in the class during his lecture would pick up their two plants. He would lecture to the plants in a class this big and they would take data on it, put it on a card, there were no computers, no cell phones, nothing like that, and then they'd put it on and put the plant back as they left them. And we have massive amounts of data the hard way. <laughs> now we're just, the students just sit on their cell phones and put in data, it's very cool. So these are just examples of some of the products that we've produced over the past 20 years in the Fast Plant program. And I've got samples of them here for you, but there are manuals that are in many foreign languages now, which is kind of cool. And this is one that we're not gonna have much time to talk about, I'm sure now, but uh, this is Fast Plants in Space and the Ukraine connection, which <coughs> is the assignment, and if you haven't read this, this story, I just say, this is what you want to do is, uh, I'll show you the slide at the end, um, just Google serendipity and the space program or something like that, if you're the space farmer, and you'll, you'll read that story. But then national programs picked up fast plants, so the Smithsonian and the National Academy picked it up and produced uh, curricula for elementary schools and middle schools using it, um, it went to Britain and became um, a national program in Britain, and on and on it goes. Partnering with it uh, came bottle biology, and I only got a couple of examples of bottle biology. The books are here, but it's really saying, hold it. When you go shopping, shop for the container, not the contents. <laughs> <laughs> and so we can turn soda bottles, food containers, into a wide range of really cool scientific equipment. And the students and the children, students become engineers as well as scientists, and that appeals to a lot of them. And so there's some examples of bottle biology here, including the chapter in the bottle biology book on making kimchi. <laughs> in BioCore three weeks ago, 
All 520 student sections in BioCore with me made their kimchi in a soda bottle. They've been doing this for 15 years and they ate it the next week. So you're invited to come down and have some of that kimchi when we're done here. Very happy to have that. Okay, so I'm just wanting to show you that the world has changed enormously from what I showed you, the print world. So now we are, we, the Fast Plant Program, is in the world, the e-world, in e-media. And so this is just an example. You can go anytime you want onto the internet and do YouTube, Fast Plant YouTube, you'll get a dozen or more instructions and examples. Twitter just rolls through, and the teachers like this one called Pinterest. I don't know why, I don't even, the first time I went on it was this weekend in Boston. I was over in Boston visiting our grandkids, and I said, I better go look at Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And I got overwhelmed. <laughs> so we get about, the, the fast plants, as best we can reckon from the seeds we produce, about 20,000 or more classrooms are, are, are hit right now, including some over, many overseas. Uh, we, we respond, the personnel, Hetty and Dan Loffer in Colorado now, answer about 50 emails a week, and we get a few web hits too, about 7,000 a month, something like that. So that's just a, a numerical. So that, that uh, sort of brings us to this very complex, but there's one thing missing I wanted to share with you, which is part of the whole wharf connection again. What's missing from this? Something I realized right from the get-go. Where does Carolina get its seed? So, Ko and I and, and uh, our, our friends set up a very small company called Tetrad. And this is seed production for quality seeds. We get our seeds when we need them from the Rapid Cycling Brasser Collection in the Department of Plant Pathology modify and produce them this way, and they are under license, go strictly to Carolina. So this is kind of completing the complexity of the thing, but it's, it is a complex world we live in. Well, I'm going to quit now because all I can say is that fast plants have been around the world. The story of this, I just mentioned these, uh, are, 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 let me put it this way, our link into the space world came through a professor, Mary Musgrave. And I, this lecture, if anything, is a tribute to Mary because she passed two years ago with cancer. But she was a professor at Louisiana State University who'd been using fast plants for her teaching and her research in gravitational biology. And long before NASA was using them, Mary was collaborating with the Russians, and the Russians were using fast plants. And we didn't even know it until she said, oh yeah, they've been on Mir. <laughs> so that's an interesting story. Uh, the story of the serendipity uh, story is, is, is pretty well uh, beefed out. So that's, that's the title of the story, and this is fast plants coming out of, this is in the shuttle days. Now it's space station time, and they're occasionally used on space station, although there are other pet plants that are like, like to be grown, I could tell you a lot of them. But we produced, and I just want to show you a special manual, because this was a collaboration. When the wall came down, most of all of the Russian cosmonauts were Russians, but the scientists were Ukrainians. And so part of the D, the, the, after the salt wall came down, the SALT agreement, the strategic arm agreement, agreed because the chief engineer for the mobile rocket launchers of, this, of the Soviet Union was a man named Kuchma, and he was, um, he eventually became the president of Ukraine. But the Russians wouldn't allow Ukrainians flights on their the scientists to fly. So they dealt with the US State Department and said, uh, we want a flight. And so we trained a cosmonaut. And that cosmonaut, there he is up there learning how to pollinate fast plants. Eventually he went up as a colonel and uh, the President Kuzma came over and we watched the launch there. We trained 
Um, we've trained a massive number of teachers here in the United States, and I went to Kiev and trained uh, 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 about 25 Ukrainian teachers from each province in Ukraine, and uh, 100,000 kids actually did the ground-based controls for that flight experiment. So it was kind of a cool thing. In each country. In each country. So if any of you can read, can read Ukrainian, this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Well, you know, what's interesting is that this comes back to roost on us because those SALT agreements, you know, we've been, I'm not, I'm not going to get political, but we've kind of uh, backed off on some of those and allowed the Russians in, as you know, to Ukraine in certain ways. But, uh, but th that was all part of this whole agreement back in the 1990s. Well, what I want to do is just review the end, to end this with sort of a, a, a philosophical review, very briefly, but... I find, you know, what is the Wisconsin idea? That's what this, this whole course is about, is what is it? For me, it's about legacy, and I think we've talked about legacy. I've shown you some of my legacy. But for, the, for me, uh, I've been captivated by this because for me, the Wisconsin idea give, gives me purpose. And out of purpose comes meaning. There are a few sort of philosophical points I want to just, this is for the students. Rest of you, you can. I'd say follow your passion. Whatever you do, choose what you love and do it. And deepen your knowledge. Create collaborations wherever possible. Broaden your understanding and experience the rewards of teamwork. These are your rewards. Cross boundaries. Move out of your box, take risks, create new comfort zones. This is what Glenn Pound told me when he said, uh, we're offering you Walker's position. He said, I said, what should I do? And he said, you will wear three hats. And that is the sinusure of the Wisconsin idea and the faculty of Wisconsin. You must excel in all research, teaching, and public service. Learn to give back. And then, I had to add this one because we had such an interesting lecture in this course about going global and thinking global and acting global. So I still believe deeply, and bottle biology has taken me around the world too, to Japan and various places where environmental science is the main way they teach all the other sciences. It's the core. And that their mantra in Japan and in Germany and various countries around the world is think global, act local. It's interesting, isn't it? Know your constituencies and learn and respond to their needs. And you saw Walker in the field responding to the needs of the cabbage growers. We, we respond daily, moment to moment, to our teachers and our kids out there. And then Walker said to me, as I'm walking past him, I said, Doc, have you got anything to teach me? And he says, uh, just remember to keep one foot in the furrow. <laughs> And that's the best possible, to me, sort of an example of what the Wisconsin idea means. And then learn and acknowledge your legacy. But my lesson is understand that you are, we all are incredibly privileged. And one last thing. I found that we don't know yet, and I wish this is where the arts and this arts comes in and the creative, the creative world, which this Wisconsin idea of course has exemplified, is learn how to say wow creatively. On that, I thank you, folks. Now I would love to invite any of you to sample our wares. Kimchi is here. And I have, just let me just say that one of my, my life mantra is that uh, I, although I re retired 20 years ago, um, I come to the campus virtually every day, ask Co if that isn't true. And um, I consider my metaphor for, I, 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 20 years ago I abandoned my lab, my office, my telephone. I said no. I will come to you.
If you want to talk to me, email me or call me and I'll come. So I view oh. this campus as my sandbox and I want to come and play with you. <laughs> okay? And that's worked out very well and so I've created a huge number literally of small sort of instructional manuals that can be you, so, I write so tiny that most of you can't read this, but it can be put on an enlarging Xerox and made into a full size. Sorry. So this gentleman here has got, but if anybody wants to uh, look at a fast plant sort of a primer, I call them my coach's manual, and this is a bottle biology stuff, but welcome to it. I'm happy for questions. I, uh, I, th I think someone needs to talk to Paul about the meaning of retirement. <laughs> um, we do have time for a couple questions, and I, I'd like to ask one to begin. Sure. So throughout this, there's been the theme of personal contact, face-to-face. -face. Um, and I don't want to ask how critical you think that is, because it's obviously very critical. But do you think Why don't you? things, well, what, what I'm going to say is, <laughs> do you think these things could even happen without that? Is there a substitute, even if it's something that's less effective maybe, is there a substitute for that face-to-face -face in, uh, in your experience? You know, I, I, I remember, I think it was Gwen refused to answer any questions of opinion. But that's okay, that was your time. I will answer any opinion. <laughs> because it's just mine, but in any event, to answer that, ask it again. <laughs> yeah, is, is there a substitute for I, I don't think there is a substitute. I, do, I think not, and part of the things that I have learned in meeting with teachers, and particularly with students here on, on the campus, because I do have this continual, occasional interaction with <laughs> undergraduates, and I must say that the reason I come to campus, really, is because you undergrads, if that's who you are, charge my batteries. You really do. You really do. So the more I can interact with you as undergrads and grad students, the more I want to be on this campus. Now, that's a prelude to what to answering your question. The question is, you guys know how to do all of this, but do you know what organ? Do you know anything really about living your life as an organism? Do you use, and I'm getting, what I'm getting at is, how many of your endowed, evolved senses, your sensory senses, do you really use in this age, other than visual and auditory? So, eyeball to eyeball is a good start, but this is a different approach. <laughs> and it's very important. I think it's hugely important in education. And we're going, how can we build it in so that the central processor, here, this is your central processor. And how much are you balancing? Think, uh, one, of our, one of our big grants, we just, I mean, what, what I, I, I just tell you, tales out of school. One of our $4 million grants was trying to, called POSO, was t trying to train and teach and have the College of Menominee Nation teach us how to teach them about science. Because they, as an indigenous people, are so, ha have been so deeply imbued in a sense of place and space. You know, there is life in that rock. Here is where I travel. How you do that and meld science into it is, is a daunting challenge for the educators at that college whose kids have to live in a world based on science. So I'm saying, how can we stimulate your multisensory? So most of my classes would encourage you to taste, to feel, to integrate everything. You, now, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that, because I see the heads nodding, that you're gardeners. Gardening is still one of the best things, and we say what? To know a plant, grow a plant. But grow means in an environment that's multi-sensory. Go out when it rains and feel the rain. Know what it's like to be cold. And put yourself in it. Okay, so this is this sort of this sort of tends on philosophy, but 
if we don't, if, 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 if we lose it, we lose it. If we lose it, we don't have it. My biggest bugaboo is that this, the world, this, this Western world, has not discovered the most fabulous untapped classroom to which we attend three times a day, regularly, because we need it for, to live. The stories that encompass our meals and how we sense it and how we do it. We, we're not touched. We haven't scratched that yet. Where does the food and how is it grown? How does it, that's geography. How does it taste? That's neuroscience. And so on and so on. You see what I'm saying? Let's turn this little thing called education upside down and give it a good re-examination. Problem is, <laughs> we're dominated by the e-world today, but I think there's hope in the Wisconsin idea I'm throwing it out to you, Gwen. How can you, how can you take the Wisconsin idea into the, gener into the next generation is gonna be a huge challenge. Because the Wisconsin idea is an evolving idea. I'm speaking as a biologist. But, uh, okay, sorry, I, I, that, that was an awful long answer. That, that was wonderful. <laughs> there's, there's no more that can possibly be said, except come down and take a look, and let's Help thank yourself you for a wonderful presentation. Thank <laughs> you.